and for putting this together in this wonderful uh, meeting and giving me the opportunity to present. Uh, so my lab focuses on uh, computational modeling to, uh, of genome organization. And the reason we are interested in the genome uh, is because it contains a complete set of DNA. And uh, I suppose uh, instruct the development and operation of an entire organism. And because of its importance, the genome has often been poetically called the uh, blueprint of life. Now, since its discovery as the genetic material, uh, significant effort has been devoted to, uh, to study the DNA. And uh, an obvious question is, uh, how does the information transfer occur, right? How do you go from base pair to a walk and talk in person? Now, a lot of progress has been made in that regard. And one of the important findings is that the, the genome structure uh, is actually quite complicated. So one cannot simply view the uh, genome uh, as just a very long double strand helix, at least not for human. Uh, so instead, uh, the genome is actually packaged in a very exquisite way to both fit inside of the nucleus and to enable uh, gene regulation. So as, as shown here, the human genome actually consists of more than 6 billion base pairs. That's, uh, uh, that's about 2 meters long when fully extended. And this set of molecules is not confined in a, into a nucleus of only about uh, 10 micrometers. So there's this... Uh, uh, five orders of magnitude difference in, in terms of the length scale. And this, uh, um, this uh, length scale difference really sort of necessitates uh, genome packaging. Uh, and uh, as shown here, the genome is kind of packaged in a, uh, you know, the genome packaging occurs over multiple length scales in kind of a hierarchical manner. And uh, remarkably, cells have also evolved ways to essentially take advantage of this packaging kind of at, at every step along the way. And for example, uh, the formation of the nucleosome uh, essentially precludes other protein from accessing the DNA. So here the DNA is showing gold here uh, in this sort of closed conformation, um, there's a tight bound to the, to the histone proteins. So then essentially by regulating this uh, uh, population of the closed and open conformation, you, you, know, you can sort of uh, regulate the DNA accessibility and in turn uh, gene expression. Uh, so, and uh, you know, sort of a similar argument can be made for a strain of nucleosome. Here you have open and closed chromatin, which uh, can again sort of regulate uh, DNA accessibility and gene expression. And uh, now at this larger scale, over millions of base pairs, uh, the formation of so-called chromatin loops, they can uh, again bring uh, DNA segments that are kind of far apart in sequence now uh, into spatial proximity. And this sort of uh, uh, 3D context uh, uh, further allows cell to encode uh, a complex uh, gene regulation. So in, in some sense, I like to think of the genome really kind of like a, an enzyme instead of a long li linear polymer. It really has to fold in 3D uh, to form active size to, kind of like, to catalyze uh, chemical reaction. And in this case, that reaction is of course a gene transcription. Now, in addition to its uh, biological significance, uh, the reason that we are particularly interested in the genome it's also because it's actually a very fun and a complex problem. And there's a, you know, a lot of sort of fascinating phenomena uh, that's uh, occurring. And better yet, uh, you know, Marty, regarding sort of uh, uh, the, uh, how the genome sort of is established in 3D, uh, you know, you know the, the underlying mechanism remains unknown. So there's a, a lot of opportunities for discovery. Um, now, of course, uh, uh, sort of opportunity always comes with the challenges. And the first challenge is, you know, is that the genome is very large, right? As, as I mentioned, you know, the, uh, you know, six billion base pair, that's a lot of atoms. And uh, um, just uh, the, you know, um, the sheer size of the system actually creates a lot of, sort of uh, issues. We as computational chemists over the years have become very good at modeling sort of a, a small scale system, but for this kind of larger scale system, there's still a lot of uh, 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 difficulty. And the second challenge is that you know the genome is you know really really large. I couldn't emphasize that enough because uh, you know two meter long that's a really macroscopic uh, scale molecule, and uh, uh, so so because of this uh, complexity of genome organization, uh, we try to study the, uh, the genome sort of at a different scales with different approaches. On the one hand, we try to study the whole genome organization. Uh, there we use an uh, integrative approach that combines modeling with experimental data, and on the other hand. On the other hand, uh, we also try to study the, uh, uh, the genome at a smaller scale with the atomistic details. Um, and today I will focus on our whole genome uh, modeling effort. Um, yeah. uh, so there, uh, you know, we are particularly interested in the principle of a genome organization uh, in the, uh, the mechanism that establishes the genome structure in 3D. Uh, so as you might expect, you know, the, the genome is very complex and so is its mechanism, right? So today we're going to focus on one particular aspect uh, that has gained a, a lot of momentum recently. 
Now, before I dive into detail, I want to remind you that uh, in the nucleus, uh, in addition to DNA, uh, as shown here, there are also uh, this membraneless structures uh, called nuclear uh, bodies. They include nucleolus and uh, speckles. And uh, so there is evidence that uh, both the genome and the nuclear body, they use liquid liquid phase suppression for their organization and for their, uh, uh, for their formation. And uh, um, for example, uh, EM image of the eukary eukaryotic genome uh, had a long review that uh, uh, there are two types of chromatin that are of occupy spatially uh, distinct region. There is a euchromatin in bright and the heterochromatin in dark colors. And this uh, you know, organization is kind of uh, reminiscent or consistent with a, a, a picture of block of polymer phase separation as, uh, as shown here. Now the liquid property of nuclear bodies uh, include their, their round morphology and their fusion upon contact. Uh, so this is basically a, a time trace of two uh, contact nucleoli that eventually sort of fuse into a larger droplet. And this is kind of a, a a typical uh, phenomena of liquid droplets. Now, uh, you know, phase suppression is a very intuitive idea, and it has a, sort of it's consistent with a, a wide variety of experimental observations. Uh, these are just two examples. However, I want to um, emphasize that you know the phase suppression also cannot explain many other uh, experiments. Uh, in particular, recently. Uh, 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 sort of several groups have uh, have found that they certain genomic loci actually have very well uh, defined distance uh, to uh, to nuclear speckles, and uh, you know this kind of very precise distance is actually inconsistent with a, with a, li a liquid picture. You know if you if we think of the nucleus as just a you know a, a, a liquid, then by definition it's supposed to be very dynamic and homogeneous, which is really can cannot encode in you know, very precise uh, distances. So another uh, puzzling observation is the apparent coexistence of multiple droplets. Um, so here the cells are, are stand with antibody to basically highlight the, the number of nucleoli. And the, uh, this is a quantification of the image shown on the left. So here you clearly see multiple nucleoli. And why is this interesting? This is interesting because it seems to be inconsistent with the uh, the, you know, this uh, classical nucleation theory, as you might know. And so the, the theory tells you that uh, the stability or the free energy of a droplet uh, it, uh, can depend on two terms. The one term comes from the uh, uh, surface tension, that sigma here, and is proportional to the uh, surface area. And then the other term that, uh, that are uh, arise from the interaction among particles and uh, is proportional to the volume. And with this expression, you can show that uh, the free energy uh, will always decrease when the droplet fields uh, merge with each other. So then uh, basically the thermodynamic equilibrium is really should just consists of one uh, single droplet as shown in this cartoon here. Uh, so then the, the obvious question is then what drives the inconsistency between the experiment and the, and the theory and uh, you know, what is maybe so special about the nucleus environment that sort of uh, stabilizes a pattern of a multiple droplet state uh, you know, over the entire cell cycle. Um, so, you know, these are the kind of questions that we, we would like to understand better with the computational modeling. Um, but to study the genome organization and the phase separation in the nucleus, we first need to build a model for the, for the genome. But as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, modeling the genome can actually be quite challenging just because of its sheer size. And to basically make any meaningful progress, we, we essentially have to throw away our beloved at least the detail and I work with the coarse grain models. Uh, so this is basically a, a cartoon for for our 3D model, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, a, a sort of each one of the 46 chromosomes, we, we represented them as a bead on a string and the chromosomes are sort of confined in a, in a sphere to mimic the nuclear envelope. Uh, so in, in one resolution that we work with, uh, each chromosome is uh, represent, sorry, each bead uh, in, in the chromosome is rep represents uh, 1 million base pairs. And uh, now with this uh, uh, coarse grain representation, uh, you can define an energy function basically sort of quantify the stability of the different uh, genome structures. So the design of the energy function itself is actually a very interesting topic and uh, basically you know, sort of a, uh, through trial and error, you can sort of actually learn a lot about the mechanism of genome organization. But uh, and in, uh, you know, in particular, we show that uh, the, a simple block of polymer phase separation actually cannot explain many features of the human genome organization. But I won't go into uh, too much details. Um, but uh, now once you have the energy, 
uh, and function, right? When, once you establish the function of form, you still need to sort of uh, parameterize the interaction within a, a, a particle because those, those interactions really, really to quantify the, the, the energy and sort of dictate the, the final uh, structure that you're going to get. Now, um, to be frank, you know, coarse grinding is actually a very popular technique in the theoretical chemistry community. However, uh, we cannot just directly borrow existing techniques and try to parameterize the genome model. And the reason is that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, each one of our beads actually contains many uh, atoms and uh, sort of just the, the sheer size and the, the complexity of the chemical composition of each bead basically renders you know, the, the sort of a, uh, traditional so-called bottom-up approach uh, inapplicable. In, in particular, we cannot afford to just run you know, quantum mechanical calculation or, or item simulation to try to parameterize the interactions and, and parameterize the genome model. Uh, so basically to, you know, to, to parameterize the model, we really kind of have to think outside the box. And in the end, uh, we establish what we call this information theoretical approach. And what it uh, allows us to do is basically, you know, uh, extract parameters from experimental data. So the experiment that we use uh, is called a high C, um, and uh, it's actually very similar to NMR, but for the genome. So what it does is basically uh, is it detects uh, contact between the DNA segment in the nucleus uh, with cross-linking, as sort of uh, illustrated here. And, uh, and the, the result is typically shown in the, as a contact map. And, um, and uh, each data point in this contact map basically tells you the probability for a pair of DNA segments uh, to be in contact in the nucleus. Now here uh, in this color scale, the probability decreases from uh, yellow to red and to white, okay? And uh, this uh, diagram basically illustrates how our sort of methodology works. Uh, we start with an energy function and with this energy function, we can then basically uh, simulate an ensemble of genome structures, as shown here. And from this ensemble of structures, we can then compute an in silico contact map. Then we can look at the difference between the uh, simulation and experiment, and we can use that difference to, uh, to basically um, uh, update the parameter to improve the energy function. And we can do this iteratively, so that in the end, we arrive at a, a converted energy function and a converted genome structure that reproduce experimental data. Uh, so, I mean, I won't go into detail, but we do have a little nice little argument to say that you know, the model we have is supposed to be optimal given uh, experimental data. Um, so after we obtain an ensemble of structures, uh, we um, carried out extensive validations uh, to ensure their biological relevance. Um, so it's probably not too surprising that our model was able to reproduce high C data, given that they were actually provided for model training so here the experiment is shown in bottom and the simulation is shown at the top. And uh, these are basically just a zoom in of a different part of the contact map. Um, and uh, you can sort of appreciate that our model was able to reproduce the contact uh, sort of across several orders of magnitude. And we do have a quantitative matrix to in, in addition to this diagram to sort of ensure that they, uh, you know, the simulation is indeed agree with the experiment very well. And importantly, in addition to the high C, uh, we also compared with a set of qualitative and quantitative uh, image uh, results. Uh, in, in particular, the chromosomes are known to form territories, and uh, you can readily see that from our simulation structure as well. Here, uh, each chromosome is assigned with a unique color, and this is basically a blow up of the simulation structure. And you can see that each chromosome is more or less sort of collapsed. There's very little intermingling among them. Um, and now if we instead color the genome with uh, different chromatin types, you can see that there is a clear phase separation between euchromatin, which is showing red, and heterochromatin showing blue. And the heterochromatin also sort of localized at the periphery, uh, with, uh, which is consistent with the EM image that I showed previously. And finally, when we look at the, uh, the radial position of individual chromosome, you can see that the simulation values actually correlate very well with the experimental results. Uh, so again, I want to emphasize that none of these uh, uh, results were actually provided for model training. So that the fact that we we're able to reproduce them uh, it, it sort of uh, provides confidence uh, in both our modeling strategy and in the uh, biological relevance of the structures. So now, now that we have a structure, you might wonder, you know, what, what, what can we do with that, right? What, what additional value do they add uh, to, to, to the genome? And uh, so uh, I would say that one advantage of having the structure is that they're actually very uh, useful for building intuitions. Uh, uh, in particular here, uh, uh, in a collaboration with uh, Brad Bernstein, we looked at the, uh, uh, the genome organization in normal and tumor cells. Um, 
so here, if you just look at the high C data, you sort of see some differences, but uh, and for example, the contact in tumor is a, a, a little bit weaker, but it's not clear to conceptualize, you know, what exactly does that mean in terms of the 3D, 3D structure. But I hope you can appreciate this uh, larger scale change, you know, from our simulations. Uh, in, in particular, unlike what you see in tumors, sorry, unlike what you see in normal cells in tumor, the the heterochromatin they actually now move away from the envelope and sort of now kind of aggregate into in the in the nuclear interior. Uh, you know, so we, we were very excited about this prediction, and we thought we wrote the manuscript. And as you, as you might expect, you know, we encountered reviewer number three and who were not very impressed and they wanted to see more, uh, more, more, more validation for the simulation predictions. And unfortunately, you know, we have excellent uh, collaborators and they, they performed electron microscopy on the, on the, on the uh, tumor and normal samples and lo and behold, they found exactly the same uh, as our simulation prediction. In particular here, the heterochromatin are again showing dark color. You can see that in normal cells, they, they localize at the nuclear periphery but in tumors, and you see that they indeed now sort of dissociated from the nuclear envelope and move to the interior. Uh, so that was kind of a record moment for me that you know the simulation agree very well with with the experiment. All right, um, and uh, now that we have a reliable model for the genome, uh, we can actually also now begin to you know think about the uh, the, the the phase separation uh, in the nucleus. Uh, to do that, we introduce the additional coarse grain particles, um, and this particle they basically try to mimic the uh, nucleolar proteins, um, which are sort of the key component of the uh, nuclear body. Um, and we basically make sure that the, the concentration, the size, and the interaction with the chromatin of this nuclear, uh, uh, of, of this coarse grain particles, sort of they, they match with uh, the, uh, nu those of the nucleolar proteins. And uh, so this particle, they sort of have attractive int interaction with each other to promote phase separation. They also can sort of uh, interact with the chromatin favorably, they interact with the a specific region of chromatin favorably. Um, so uh, basically after introducing this corresponding particles, we can essentially perform a dynamical simulation of phase separation in the nucleus. Uh, so here the, uh, uh, the, the, the protein particle, they are showing in orange and the, the, the chromosome are showing uh, gray. And I'm just gonna play one uh, movie that sort of is a typical uh, a simulation trajectory. And as you can see that as the stimulation evolves, uh, yeah, we started with from a kind of a random distribution of the protein particles. At the time it evolves, you see that the particles themselves sort of, they will aggregate into small clusters and small clusters will coarsen into bigger clusters. And, uh, um, and interestingly, in the end of the simulation actually settled into two droplets, not one, but two droplets. And that's uh, interesting because that's again, sort of kind of inconsistent with the, the expectation of the classical nucleation theory. Um, but it, it is sort of consistent with the uh, uh, biological observations. And we can also monitor the number of clusters as a function of time. You can see that you know, basically you have an initial burst of, of clusters at the beginning, but then that, that gradually coarsen, but it's and eventually settled down to two to droplets. Uh, and uh, uh, and we, uh, we performed additional simulations and uh, just to, uh, to see whether this uh, is statistically significant. And uh, you know, as you can see here, in all but one simulation, we actually always sort of arrive at uh, a multiple droplets in the, in the end of the simulation. So now this will actually become uh, uh, quite interesting. Now, now before we get too excited, we also perform the additional sort of uh, comparisons with the dynamical uh, measurements from from experiment to, to sort of see whether uh, the, the dynamics of our simulation it makes sense or not. Now, so in particular, here we looked at uh, the study from the Brangwen group. Uh, so we're so he, they actually monitored the coarsening kinetics uh, of droplets directly in the cell nucleus. It's actually a very cool experiment. And they, what they did is they, they monitored the, the size of the average size of the droplets as a function of time. And you can see that the uh, this size increase uh, sort of was well, there a power behavior of, of the size as a function of time, and this exponent is around 0.1. And this, this exponent itself is kind of uh, peculiar because it's, uh, you know, it deviated from the canonical value, which is around one over three. Um, but our simulation was actually able to uh, uh, reproduce that very, uh, very nicely. And in this other experiment from the, the Wesker lab, um, so they, here they directly monitor the, 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 uh, the fusion kinetics of two droplets. And they sort of uh, measure the, the, the neck radius of the, uh, of the fusion uh, as a function of time. And you can see that this uh, radius uh, increase uh, uh, sort of again sort of follows a, a parallel 
and uh, the, the exponent is around one over two, and then agree with, with, with our simulation as well. And as a final check, we also sort of went back to our tumors and we now uh, we decide we determined we basically performed a dynamic simulation uh, of phase separation in tumors. And here everything was kept the same regarding the, 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 the protein particles, the concentration, the interaction with the chromatin, everything was kept the same. The only thing that we changed was uh, the interaction uh, between chromosomes. So here now the interaction was derived from tumor high C uh, instead of the normal high C uh, uh, in our previous simulation. And interestingly, that change actually resulted in more, more nucleoli uh, in tumors compared to, uh, to, to normal samples, as you can see here. And that's interesting because uh, tumors are actually known to have more nucleoli. So, so the fact that we were able to reproduce that trend, at, at least qualitatively, is quite exciting. Uh, so, so again, you know, all, all of this uh, qualitative and quantitative comparison that sort of, uh, again, sort of support the uh, the, the biological, biological relevance of our simulation. So now we can maybe go back to look at the simulation details and maybe learn something about, about the system. Uh, in particular, we want to understand why are we seeing multiple droplets in our simulation, right? Um, and you know, as a chemist, chemist, I like to sort of think of this from a, a reaction perspective. So we, we introduce a reaction coordinate and this reaction coordinate basically uh, measures the distance between the two droplets. So at a larger distance, the, the two droplets are sort of uh, separated from each other. And at a small distance, they sort of they will fuse. Um, and we then computed a free energy profile along this reaction coordinate. Uh, so what you see is that, uh, interestingly, we saw a free energy barrier. And, uh, and this barrier are, uh, appears when the two droplets sort of begin to uh, touch each other. Uh, this is, again, sort of uh, inconsistent with the, maybe the which you might expect from the uh, clacal serial phase separation. And uh, um, then we sort of uh, try to understand the, you know, what, why do we see a barrier here? And we performed a free energy decomposition. We found that the, the barrier is mostly uh, uh, arise from an uh, anthropic origin. And then we sort of scratched our head a little bit and we saw, thought, you know, and we saw that uh, there could actually be a very intuitive explanation for this anthropic barrier. And the reason is that uh, the, the protein droplets, um, they are essentially tethered to the surrounding chromatin network because of favorable protein chromatin interaction. So then as the droplets try to sort of uh, fuse and they, they move close to each other, they will basically you know, pull on the, uh, on the chromatin network. They will basically put more constraint on the chromatin network. And the chromatin network is made of polymers, I guess in a naive approximation, they are kind of like a rubbers. And when you pull on the rubbers, they, they're gonna be a, a sort of countering force. Uh, to, and this countering force um, and is known to have an anthropic origin and that will sort of give rise to this uh, barrier. Uh, so this kind of reminded me of this cable crossover that I kind of enjoyed doing before, but you know, this is more like uh, overcoming gravity, not really entropy, but you, you get the idea. Um, so, so our study on this uh, nucleolite kind of support that the chromatin network could actually impact the formation of nuclear bodies. Um, but in, in the meantime, you can, you, you can see, you expect that the, the nuclear body, they will also uh, you know, impact the chromatin network as well. And that point actually really become very clear in our latest study where we try to um, uh, now build a more complete picture for the nucleus. So here, in addition to the genome and the nucleoli, we also included the speckle and a nuclear la uh, lamina. Those are sort of key components of the nucleus. So in this model, uh, in addition to reproducing the genome organization, uh, we are are now also able to reproduce the contact between the genome and the uh, various uh, nuclear landmarks. Uh, so this is supposed to provide a more uh, accurate picture for the, for the nucleus. But uh, interestingly, now this model actually also help us to understand how would the, uh, the precise distance that I mentioned in the beginning would arise uh, in, in the nucleus. And uh, the idea that uh, we think that the, uh, the genome and the nuclear body, they sort of can form through a self-assembly process uh, through sort of basically a co-phase separation mechanism. And as sort of shown here uh, in this mechanism, uh, the nuclear body, they will basically nucleate uh, uh, around the chromatin segments um, as sort of a, uh, uh, because of favorable interactions. And this nucleation essentially ensures their sort of a close contact uh, with the individual cells. And because this nucleation also happens in all cells, so this, this will essentially ensure that the certain uh, genomic region to always have a very well-defined distance uh, with, the, with the nuclear speckles. And this explains the, the precise distance, distance that have been uh, shown in previous uh, experiments. But in the meantime, uh, because of phase separation is non-specific, uh, uh, got it. <laughs> in different cells, you also 
they, 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 they basically the nucleation could use a different set of chromatin segments. So there is a heterogeneity in the chromatin segment that are nucleating the, uh, uh, the nuclear body in different cells. And this heterogene heterogeneous context could sort of give rise to the uh, heter uh, heterogeneous chromosome position in, in individual uh, nucleus as well. Uh, and the, so this basically this is a simple co-phase separation mechanism that can actually reconcile this, uh, you know, both of this precise and heterogeneous uh, feature of genome organization, which may sort of seem a little bit contradictory, uh, you know, at, at, at first sight. Um, so okay. Just, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'm, uh, so, yeah, I, I showed you one mechanism about the genome organization, but we are trying to sort of use that to, to try to predict genome organization and to see the impact on genome function. And I'm running out of time, so I want to thank my uh, uh, lab member who actually did the work. I was fortunate to work with an excellent group of people, and thank my funding, and thank you for your attention. Yep. Okay, uh, very, uh, very uh, exciting talk. So we see there are a lot of questions. Um, let me just read a few of them. Um, you already answered my question on this uh, uh, polymer constraint thing. I think this guy, uh, Robin Bursuma, asked you um, by starting with the high seed map. Are you not introducing by hand the incomplete phase separation that you are wanting to explain? Um, so we. With the high C, yes, we do in sort of, uh, 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 we do, uh, yes, I mean, high C in fact more or less tells you this phase separation. That is correct. Uh, I mean, yeah, so high C encodes that, but, um, but high C does not really tell you much about the, the nuclear body phase separation. I guess, I, I don't know which part of the phase separation you're, you're the, the Robin was referring to. Um, but, uh, you know, it, 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 yes, I mean, the fact that we were able to reproduce this phase separation, that is, that is totally from high C data. I, um, I, um, hi, um, I, I was know. referring particularly to the chromosome territories because the high C map in a way includes all the physics which leads to the chromosome territories. Uh, that's fair. Yeah, you, you, are, you are absolutely correct in that. So yeah, because that, that's why you, know, you can sort of see that there's a very kind of a strong contact in each block that actually corresponds to individual chromosomes. Um, but I would say this part is, a, uh, you know, it's definitely not apparent from high C that the fact that we were able to reproduce the radial position of a chromosome. Uh, so, I mean, I mean it, it, it is in some sense still encoded in high C, but I would say it's not obvious that, you know, a model just based on high C would, have, would be able to reproduce that uh, in terms of the radial position of chromosomes. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, there are some uh, questions on the details of your simulation. One thing, uh, Pinaki uh, Swan asks you, do the number of droplets in simulation de depend on the interacting strength between chromatin uh, bees and the protein bees? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Absolutely. Uh, so we actually uh, show that, I, I didn't show that result here. We have actually have that in, in our manuscript. Uh, so basically, as we increase the strength of the uh, interaction, we actually see more droplets. And the idea that uh, uh, Basically, the, the, the droplets that form through nucleation are, are around, are around the chromatin, then they will sort of uh, basically fuse. And uh, at, at a stronger strength, it will make the nucleation easier. So, so you initially, you have more droplets in the beginning. And because the, the, the coarsening is sort of kinetically arrest, you know, if you start, if you nucleate more, you're going to end up with, uh, with more droplets. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And also probably also the protein concentration, right? The protein concentration, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that's true as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, we we I mean we sort of would just try to sort of uh, more or less fix the quantum concentration based on the biological values. But uh -huh, uh -huh. correct, yeah. Yeah, uh, Rafael asks you, uh, how do you determine when to stop the simulation in the phase separate study? Uh, how does number of droplets depends on simulation time? So I want to make sure it's uh, you know whether it's metastable or not, right? That's a that's a excellent point. I mean, I guess you can see that. Uh, in, I mean, we, we can sort of more or less map our simulation time scale to sort of uh, experimental time scale. You know, we sort of run about uh, several hours. Um, but you know, if you look at the free energy, I mean, you are correct that the 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 this single droplet state is still the thermodynamic minimum. Uh, so that if you run it infinitely long, uh, you you would probably in the end still end up in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, you know uh, uh, single droplet state. That's why you know we, we call this sort of kinetic arrest. But you know, that's sort of in our uh, reasonable simulation time scales, you know, if we can map to biological value on the order of maybe several hours a day. I mean, that, that this basically gets a rest in its multiple droplet state. We do not mm -hmm. see sort of further coarsening anymore. Mm 
Yeah. So let me see. Uh, probably uh, last question is uh, uh, Jing Chen asked you, are the droplets sourced with the hydrochromatin and euchromatin domain respectively, or other distinct connected domains? Sorry, could you say that again? Uh, are the droplets uh, sourced with the hydrochromatin and euchromatin domains respectively, or other distinct connected domains? So, so the, are, what's are the, the nature of the droplets? Are they uh, connect to the uh, uh, associated with the hydrochromatin, euchromatin, or there are some other features? I see. So this uh, droplet, so these are we are trying to model the nucleolus. Uh, so the nucleolus there are actually so they they um they they are sort of they are functions sort of for this uh, uh, ribosomal RNA. So they actually sort of uh, uh, associate with very very specific uh, set of chromatin, uh, in particular those sort of uh. uh segment for, for transcribing the ribosomal RNA, but they also have sort of a, a maybe more more than those those region like called uh, nucleolus associated domains. Uh, so yeah, so, so I mean, those are typically heterochromatin, you are correct. Um, yeah, but it's not just for heterochromatin, they are also important for for, transcri for transcription as well. Yeah. 